We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, church family. Great to see you all here. It is certainly beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Uh, how about you? Are anyone else love Christmas more than any other season of the year? Right? Where my Christmas people at? It's not too early, you know, as, as far back as you can. You put that Christmas music on. You get the decorations up. Come on, be, be real. Anyone in here still need to decorate for Christmas? All right, I'll give you till the end of the day, all right? You have till the end of the day. You got to get it done, all right? Hey, we, uh, we're really excited about this series we're going to spend uh, as we kick off the Christmas season together in a series called The Great Expectations. And my name is Matt, and I serve here at at ACC as a lead pastor, if we haven't had a chance to meet yet. Uh, one of the things that um, I, I've noticed is that we live in a time period right now where we are really lousy at needing, at, at waiting patiently for anything. Because we don't have to wait for anything anymore. Have you noticed that? I mean, if you uh, w- want to get, you know, back in the day, right, you wanted to send a letter to someone, right, you had to write it by hand, okay, you had to write it, like, what's that about, right? And then you gave it to somebody, and they got on a horse, right, and they had to, like, deliver it to the other side of the country or something, and maybe a couple months from now, they might get the message that you wanted them to know. But nowadays, right, if you, uh, you're just watching a program on TV, and you see someone and you're saying, I, I know I've seen that person somewhere before. You can find the answer right away, right? You just Google it. You go to IMDB, right? And you're like, who is, ah, right? You, you have a question. You figure it out online. You, you want to get a, an answer from somebody. We just text them now, right? We send them a quick little text. And sometimes, how many of you are guilty of this, right? You text someone and it responds back that this person currently has their notifications silenced. And you're like, nah. And you hit that reject, right? You say, send anyway, right? You totally, I don't care that they don't want to hear from you. I want them to know what I want them to know right now, right? We're really lousy at waiting. We get hungry. We got fast food. Don't want to leave the house, right? We got Uber Eats and DoorDash, right? We want, we want something. Uh, we, we can now order on Amazon and get like same day delivery sometimes. How many of you have done same day delivery? It's crazy. So here's the problem that that causes. When we actually have to wait for something, we're really lousy at it. We're like a a whole world of, uh, at least here, American people, right? we're, We're pretty good at getting things right away, which means we're really bad at having to wait for anything. We've kind of lost the art of, of patient, patient eagerness, expectance, right? You think about it though, as we're talking about Christmas, it's one of the seasons of the year where we know the whole season is filled with kind of a, an eagerness. It's filled with hope. It's filled with kind of an expectance of, of maybe what's under the tree or what are we going to do for this and what. There's all, just a lot of joy built into the season for most people. And it's a season filled with expecting. If you think about, though, throughout the Bible, all of the generations, and we're going to look at that today, all the generations have been expecting, expecting a Savior. In fact, if you look at Luke 3, 15, here's what it says. It says, everyone was expecting the Messiah to come soon. And it goes on, it says, they were eager to know whether or not John might be the Messiah. So we're talking about John the Baptist here. So John the Baptist, he's a, a really great guy. The Bible has an incredible, you know, Jesus says something about John. He doesn't say anyone else. He says, man, there's never been other than, than you know, the, John's like, John's the man, right? That's what Jesus has to say about John. And, and people are seeing John and they're thinking, wow, John, as they're eagerly expecting a savior, they're thinking maybe 
John's the guy that we've been expecting this whole time. Maybe John's the guy. But one of the things that we can see is, is that everyone, the entirety of the world, was expecting the Messiah. Everyone has, even if you don't know about the Bible, even if you don't even agree with me on what this says, there's, a, there's an eagerness in all of us that recognizes that there's something desperately broken about the world we live in and that there's something that we're longing. There's an eager expectation of something better. The whole world was expecting this Messiah. Everyone was expecting the Messiah to come soon. You wonder how far back did this expecting go? These people who were expecting the Messiah, how far back in their history did that expectation begin? And one of the things we're going to see today as we're talking about an expectant world is that that went all the way back to the beginning, all the way back to the beginning of the story of human creation. You know, one of the things I want to teach you real quick about the Bible is that Jesus doesn't just show up in the second act. Jesus isn't a character in the Bible that just when you get to the New Testament, you start hearing about Jesus. Jesus is actually the theme of the entirety of Scripture. As God is revealing who he is, you learn about who God is through the person of Jesus from front cover to back cover. In fact, the Old Testament, you want to know the theme of the Old Testament? The theme of the Old Testament is Jesus is coming. That's what the Old Testament is about. It's a broken, messed up world that humans screwed up, and then from that moment on, you get to see the whole account of people expecting a Messiah. That's the Old Testament. And then the first four books of the New Testament, we call the Gospels, the, really the theme of the Gospels is Jesus is here. That Jesus you were expecting, he's arrived. And then the rest of the, uh, the New Testament, Acts through the book of Revelation, is Jesus is coming again. It's all about Jesus. So if you go back into the Old Testament and you realize that Jesus has always been a part of the story, he's always been the common denominator, he's, he's part of everything, he was there at the beginning, you have to ask yourself, when did this eager expectation and waiting for a Savior begin? And it takes you all the way back to the front chapter, the front cover of your Bible. It goes all the way back into the garden because we have to understand that if the world is waiting for a savior, the world recognizes that they need something, that they, they need to be saved, that, that everything's broken. So I want to share with you kind of, if you go all the way back to the beginning, remember God created everything and each day he looked at what he created and he said it was good. And then he created man in his image and he created Eve and he looked at what he had created and he says, it is very good. Everything was just as God wanted it to be. It was good. We're just like two chapters into the Bible. Everything's great. But one thing that we all need to understand about love, okay, is that love isn't really love unless it's freely given. If God had programmed you to love him in return, then that's not really love. Nobody would be fooled by that. So what God did in knowing that love has to be freely chosen, it has to be something that you freely give in order for it to really be love, what he did when he created everything, and he created everything, and it was all very good, in order to create a situation in which his creation could choose to love him, he put in the middle of the garden a choice. He put in the middle of the garden a tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He says, listen, I want you guys to understand, good and evil existed already at that moment. Good and evil was already, uh, there, there's already, we know of, of he, he, he even allowed his angels to choose whether or not they were going to love him. And some of the angels decided they weren't going to. And that's how we even have a serpent in the garden. We have Satan in the form of a serpent. All, evil is already in existence. But God puts this tree, the knowledge of good and evil, and he says, listen, you can do things my way, and you don't have to worry about this good and evil thing. You don't even have to know about it. You can be completely ignorant. And you can choose me and my path. You can choose to love me my way. Or, as Eve went and took from that tree and ate from it and gave some to Adam and he ate from it, you can be doing things your way. 
And this knowledge of good and this knowledge of evil comes flooding into the human experience. Not just the human experience, but it says that the whole earth, all of creation was cursed because of this knowledge of good and evil. In fact, in Romans 8, it says this, against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. The very beginning of the story, all creation was subjected to God's curse. You want to know where tornadoes come from and earthquakes come from and natural disasters come from and where all this, but even creation, why animals fight other animals and why there's just death and decay and all brokenness everywhere you look, it all comes back to the garden, the curse. But then it says about creation, it says with eager hope, there it is again, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. So what I want you to understand is when there is some sort of eagerness, some sort of expectation, it's because there's a legitimate need for something. And all of creation felt it. All of humanity felt it. As we step into just the third chapter of Scripture, we understand that we are seeing a world that knows that it is desperately in need of saving. Everything's broken. And the same is still really true today. Everything is still broken. We now have We're now on the other side of Jesus in our history timeline. We now are no longer waiting for Jesus. We're part of the the church history where Jesus has already come. But if you go back into the Old Testament, you see the very beginning of people expecting and needing and knowing and wanting a Savior. Listen, if I found out that some person on the other side of the nation is expecting a Uh, Amazon delivery today. It doesn't change my day at all. I don't care. It's not my package. It's not coming to my house. But when I know that something that is of value to me, something that I'm invested in, something that will change my life is is on the horizon, then that expectant hope, that eagerness that we've all felt when we know a package is coming, right? That's the That's the eagerness that the world before Jesus was walking in. They knew they needed a Savior, but a Savior had not yet come. So how far back, right? All the way back to Genesis, but how far back was that first little glimpse of hope? When was that first little bit of expectancy worked into the story of human history? Well, let me show you that as the fall created the need and a longing began, we started expecting some things. And it goes, the first thing that we've been expecting all the way back to the very beginning, we've, we've been expecting peace. We've been expecting peace. And this expecting started right after the fall. In fact, in Genesis chapter 3, all right, so again, you might not know your Bible really well. I'll give you a little tidbit. This is just three chapters in. You start the very first book of your Bible. You're in Genesis. Genesis 1, Genesis 2, and here we are in Genesis 3. We see the expectant world become an expectant world. And here's what it says. God is talking to the serpent, and he says, And I will cause hostility between you and the woman. And between your offspring and her offspring, he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Right there, God is speaking to the serpent. If you have the NIV Bible, your your version of this scripture is so much cooler. It says that he will crush your head. He says to the serpent that one day a descendant of Eve a descendant of Eve will, will be in existence that was going to crush the head of the serpent. But first notice that it says that the serpent will also strike at this descendant's heel. See, one day, 
there was a moment in the past where Satan was watching as Jesus was crucified on a cross and as he's striking at the hill of this offspring and he's thinking, right now, look, I took your savior, your little precious Jesus, and I had you all put him up on a cross and now he's dead. But scripture tells us that we're expecting someone not just who's going to get his heel bitten by the serpent, but that the person on the cross is going to crush the head of that serpent. And we now know that through his resurrection, we have access to, to see Satan's head crushed once and for all through Jesus. But you see, this, this concept of expecting peace, what is the thing that God said? He said, I will cause hostility. You know what hostility is? Essentially, first of all, there's nobody in this room, right, that loves hostility. I can't imagine. If you love hostility, you need to go see a counselor because that's not healthy, right? We all avoid hostility. We avoid conflict at all costs. We don't like moments where things just seem out of peace. We, we enjoy having things calm, being at peace with the people around us. Those are things that, should, that we should be longing for. And when this promise that I'm going to cause hostility because of this brokenness, there's going to be hostility in the picture. In that moment, the world was now expecting this Savior to come and crush the head of the serpent and bring peace back into the picture. Because peace was out of the picture. Hostility was there to rule the day. You know that tree in the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You really think about it, the knowledge of good and evil. See, if, if you have children, right, and, and maybe you're experiencing a, a season of life where things are a little difficult, maybe there's a little bit more arguing going on in the house, maybe you're experiencing some financial difficulty, one of the things you'll notice that you'll do as parents with your children is you'll do your best to guard them and shield them and protect them from all that. Your kids, you, you might be like not knowing how to pay your next electric bill, but for the most part, you do whatever you can to make sure your kids are like, woohoo, things are great. My, my childhood is awesome. For many of us, we're like, my childhood was great. And your parents are like, well, man, if you only knew what was going on in the background. And what God had done with the tree, he says, listen, you don't have to be aware of the good and the evil. But we, we entered in, grabbed from the fruit, and ate from it, and this knowledge of good and evil, this, this hostility, this conflict that all of us experience every day came into the picture. And in the Old Testament, they didn't even have yet Jesus, all they had was promises of Jesus. They had a promise that one of Eve's descendants was going to crush the head of the serpent and bring peace back into the picture. It's something they expected. Here's another example of this peace that was expectant. In Micah, again, in the Old Testament, Micah was a prophet who existed before Jesus. All right, so this is Old Testament. Jesus hasn't come yet. And, and Micah, as a prophet, he says this, but you, O Bethlehem Ephrata, there it is, that little town of Bethlehem. Micah already knows about Bethlehem because God has revealed it to him and now he's prophesying about it. He says, but you, O Bethlehem, you are, or you are only a small village among all the people of Judah, yet a ruler of Israel whose origins are in the distant past. <laughs> I love that. Yet a ruler of Israel whose origins are in the distant past. Maybe, uh, I don't know, creation, maybe before creation, all eternity. Will come from you on my behalf. The people of Israel will be abandoned to their enemies until the woman in labor gives birth. Then at last... His fellow countrymen will return from exile to their own land, and he will stand to lead his flock with the Lord's strength in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. Then his people will live there undisturbed, for he will be highly honored around the world. Read this last sentence with me out loud. You ready? Do it better than the 830 service, y'all. They were tired. You ready? Here, last sentence. 
and he will be the source of peace. There it is, a promise in the Old Testament. Before Jesus, one day there's going to be a child and there's going to be a mother and she's going to give birth in Bethlehem and that child is going to be the source of peace. I love it. There was an expectant world that wanted the opposite of hostility. They wanted peace, and they were promised it. Another thing that you see the Old Testament church expecting was they were expecting blessing. They had promises throughout prophecy in the Old Testament that said one day there's going to be a blessing that comes in the form of a Messiah. In Genesis, still, Genesis 22 Starting in verse 15, a little bit of context. We have Abraham has just honored God by trusting him with the son that was promised to him. God said, listen, I want you to take that son that that I promised you and that you didn't think was possible, but that son that came, I want you now to take him and I want you to take him up on the mountain. I want you to sacrifice him for me. And Abraham probably didn't understand quite why God was asking him to do this, but he faithfully took his son up the hill, up the mountain, was ready to sacrifice him. And God said, no, 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 don't don't, don't actually do it. I wanted to see if you would. And then he says this. Then the angel of the Lord called again to Abraham from heaven. This is what the Lord says. Because you have obeyed me, And have not withheld even your son, your only son. I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies. And through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed." all because you have obeyed me. Do you know what this promise of blessing is all about? Again, it's a promise to Abraham, one day through your offspring, through your descendants, one day will come a a, a blessing that is going to be such an incredible blessing, such a powerful blessing. It's It's a big enough of a blessing that all the nations of the earth will have access to this blessing through one of your offspring, Abraham. Again, another promise that the Old Testament believers were able to hang on to. And and not only were they expecting one day to have peace brought back into their story, but they're told to expect blessing. You know, what's tough, though, about this blessing is that no timeline was given. It wasn't a, hey, expect a blessing and it's going to come tomorrow. Or expect a blessing and it's going to come in the form of this or what kind of blessing, that the story is a little vague. I'm reminded of a study that uh, they, they did, uh, some people did with some children. It was a psychology experiment, and what they did is they had a child in a room, and they put in front of that child one of those jumbo-sized marshmallows. And they said to the child, listen, you can eat that marshmallow right now if you'd like, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave the room for five minutes, and then I'm going to come back. And if you haven't eaten that marshmallow yet, I'll give you a second marshmallow, and then you can eat both of them. Really simple instructions. If you go onto YouTube and search the marshmallow experiment, a lot of people have done it. It's pretty hilarious to watch what some of the kids will do in that moment. Some of them are just like, mm, I don't got five minutes, right? They eat that marshmallow. I want the marshmallow now, right? Some of them, you can sit there patiently. You can see them just staring at the marshmallow. They start shaking, you know, like some of them are licking the marshmallow. That doesn't count, right? Some of them are eating the bottom half of the marshmallow and putting it back so it looks like they haven't touched it. You know, all sorts of, but can you imagine if God made a promise of a future blessing to you, but there was no timeline attached to it. There wasn't a hey in five minutes or in a thousand years. But one day, a blessing is going to come, and it's going to help you through this, this really cruddy situation you put yourself in. It would have been hard to, to know exactly what that was, but at the end of the day, the people, the followers of God in the Old Testament, we see them promised at some point in time 
a blessing. I don't know about you, but I'm glad we're on the other side of that fulfilled promise of Jesus. I'm glad we're not still waiting around for this blessing. But in the Old Testament, they were expecting blessing. How about this third one? They were also expecting victory. In your, uh, again, in your Old Testament, there's um, a story. I'll give you a little context for this passage I'm about to read. There's a story of a king, and this king was so opposed to God's people that he hired a sorcerer named Balaam. And he hired this sorcerer and says, Balaam, I want you to do what you are uniquely gifted to do, and I want you to, to, to curse God's people. I want you to speak a curse over them so that they stop thriving, they stop being protected, that all the things that seem to be going well for them, I just want you to curse them. And Balaam, uh, this is something that, I mean, he's not, he's not a prophet of God, He's, he's someone who's been hired specifically to curse God's people. But one of the things he realizes as he goes to curse God's people is the only thing that'll come out of his mouth is blessing over God's people. He doesn't have enough strength to get a curse out. And he keeps reporting back to the king saying, I, I, for some reason, my eyes have been opened to truth. I can see clearly now the work that's happening behind the scenes supernaturally. And I'm telling you, you're not going to be able to curse this people. I can't get the words out of my mouth. And this is what he says in Numbers 24, in verse 15, it says, this is a message of Balaam, the son of Beor, the message of the man whose eyes see clearly. The message of one who hears the words of God, who has knowledge from the Most High, who sees a vision from the Almighty, who bows down with eyes wide open. He still hasn't even told you what the message is, but here's what Balaam is trying to say. My eyes have been opened. My ears are hearing very clearly. I've seen what I saw, and the message is so compelling, it says, I am now bowing down to this one true God. And here's what he says in verse 17. He says, I see him, this prophecy I've seen, I see this, this Savior, but not here and now. I perceive him, but far in the distant future. A star will rise from Jacob. A scepter will emerge from Israel. You get this imagery of a king that's going to come, a star that's going to rise up, holding a scepter in his hand from Jacob's line, right? It says, it will crush the heads of Moab's people, cracking the skulls of the people of Sheth. Edom will be taken over, and Seir, its enemy, will be conquered, while Israel marches on in triumph. A ruler will rise in Jacob who will destroy the survivors of Ir. You see, the promise that's made here, the prophecy that's made through someone who wasn't even meant to be a prophet of God. He's just a, a sorcerer meant to be used against God's people. And God says, oh, I've got a prophecy for you. I've got some words for you to speak. And as these blessings are coming out of his mouth and he sees clearly, he sees clearly a star that is going to come up and be risen up from the, the line of Jacob that is going to be kingly and is going to once and for all bring victory for God's people. So imagine now if you're an Old Testament person, one of God's chosen people, you recognize the brokenness of the earth. You recognize the brokenness of yourself. You recognize the sin and the, the, the depravity all around you. How much you must have wanted and longed for peace. How much you must have longed and, and wanted blessing. How, how much you probably expected and couldn't wait for victory. There's something special about victory. All of us, again, that's another thing we all kind of share in human experience. I don't think anybody sets down to play a game and you think, man, I really hope I lose this time. 
right? You don't do that. We all, we all enjoy victory, right? We, we all, we put on a game, right? We put on a football game and we, we have our team that we support and when we sit down, we expect them to win, unless they're the Cowboys, right? We expect, we expect a victory. We, we, we hope, we, even if they're not that great, right? We're like, man, maybe today. And God's people in this moment, they see the brokenness of the situation around them. And they're like, man, peace would be really nice right now. Blessing would be really great right now. Certainly victory would be something that we would welcome into our story. And see, the truth is, that all throughout the Old Testament, there are many more promises about a Messiah. I only took time to share four of them with you this morning that showed us those three things. But what all those prophecies pointed to was that one day there was gonna be a Messiah that was gonna come. What do we know now? Is we know that the one who will bring peace and the one who will bring blessing, and the one who will bring victory, he's already come, and his name is Jesus. He's why we do Christmas. It's all about Jesus. We understand that there was a waiting world, an expectant world that, that longed to see the answer to all their suffering. And we're now on the other side, and we already know that that peace, and that blessing, and that victory, we have access to it through faith in Jesus. You see, those things, that peace and that blessing and that victory, you don't, they're not just given freely to everyone. Part of the, the plan of salvation, the gospel message, is that, remember, God doesn't force anybody into love with him. He doesn't force any single person in this room. You will not spend eternity with Jesus unless you want to. And so part of the plan to make sure you had the free choice to decide whether or not you want to love because love without freedom isn't love at all. He sent his son Jesus and through placing your faith in Jesus and his knowing that he died on the cross after living a perfect life for you. And that though Satan, the serpent, thought that he had won as he, he struck at his heel and he looked up and he thought he was claiming victory. We know in that moment that after three days, Jesus conquered death. And Jesus has offered to us that, listen, if you place your faith in me, one day, instead of you standing alone before the Father to answer for your brokenness, instead, you can let Jesus stand in your place. And Jesus lived a perfect life. You can put your faith in him. You can let Jesus take care of your sin on the cross. And you can let Jesus stand in your place before the Father. And you can be seen as white as snow, sinless, perfect and righteous. But you only have access to that peace. You only have access to that blessing. And you only have access to that victory through Jesus. If you continue to try to find that peace and that blessing and that victory on your own, you are just spinning wheels. You are wasting your time. It's not going to happen. This room is filled with people who will share their testimonies of how they have found blessings and peace and victory through the person of Jesus Christ. We will experience this peace and this blessing and victory eternally and perfectly when Jesus returns again. But you can experience this peace and this blessing and this victory today. Though an imperfect version of it because we live in this really broken world, you can experience this peace and this blessing and victory right now through putting your faith in Christ. So as our what now, God, kind of question that we ask every Sunday, here's, here's what I want to ask you to consider. If you're in this room right now and you haven't made a decision for yourself to find that peace, to find that blessing, and to find that victory through Christ alone, I pray that this would be the day that you decide, I'm not gonna keep fighting my battles on my own. I wanna trust Jesus. I wanna allow his life and his death and his resurrection to be what ushers in the peace and the blessing and victory into my life. Let's pray together.
Father, I pray right now that if there's any person in this room that has yet to put their faith and their trust in you and who you claim to be, if there's anyone in this room that is still trying to find victory on their own, they're still hoping and expecting blessing, they're still longing for peace in all the hostility of their life, that they would recognize here in this moment that the only way to access those things is through the Jesus that you promised throughout the Old Testament, the Jesus that came, that you talk about in your Gospels, and the Jesus that we know will come again one day to bring in the perfect version of all of those things into our life. I pray that any single one person, multiple people in this room right now that need to, to walk out of this room changed eternally, that they would have the courage today to say something, to tell someone, I want to be saved. And I pray that you'd give them the courage to make that decision today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, church, let me share a thought with you. There's something that we used to say a lot in churches when I grew up, and I don't know why we don't say it very often anymore. We used to use the phrase, I am saved, or I got saved. Have you noticed that? We don't really say that much anymore. I don't know why. Maybe it sounds weird, or it, to the outside world, it sounds odd or something. But at the end of the day, I want you to know there's something powerful about saying, I was saved. Because when you re recognize that you're broken, when you recognize this world is broken, when you recognize the truth that you're headed to an eternity apart from Christ, and there's something special about the fact that when I was a young boy, I put my faith in Christ and in that moment I was saved from all that mess. I am proud to say I am saved. And if there's anyone in this room they are saying, I need to be saved. I need to be saved from the mess of my life. I need to be pulled out of this broken world and into the peace and blessing and victory that's available to me. Would you just do me a favor today? Would you, sometime between services, I'm easy to find, I'm tall and I'm fat, all right? So out there somewhere, find me. Find one of our pastors and just say, listen, I need to be saved. And we'd be happy to talk you through what that looks like, to lead you through that, and to even give you some next steps and how you can walk into a new life in Christ. Don't leave today. Don't pull out of our parking lot today the same way you came in here. All right? Yeah. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.